Good morning, and thank you so much for being here. It's such an honor to be here with you. And in some ways, I got to pinch myself this morning to make sure this is real. Um, it seems like in some ways, you know, this started a while ago, and in some ways, it feels like it was just the other day as we started talking about these ideas and opportunity for me to be here with you and, and talk through this series. Um, a, a couple of quick disclosures to get out of the way as, as we get started here. So uh, if you have heard any of this material before, it's because I've ripped some of it off for Michael and he's ripped some of it off for me. Um, so bear with us here. We co-authored a lot of this stuff together a few years ago. Um, and I appreciate, you know, Michael's friendship all the years. We've known each other for, you know, pushing 20 years. I don't feel like I should be that old, um, but we have. And uh, we've worked together on, on a lot of different things. And so I'm very thankful just to be here with you to be able to present these ideas. And hopefully it's some things that can help challenge your faith this week, challenge the way you look at some things, and make you better, because that's, that's what this is all about, right? We're just trying to make each other better. We're trying to stir each other up to love and to good works, and I hope as we look at what we do as being in the salt of the earth, what that means in its totality, hopefully that can help us be a little bit better as we interact with others. So in our country, for some reason, Christmas season keeps getting earlier and earlier, I'm half convinced we're going to start Christmas now after 4th of July, and probably sometime this week, they're going to play this movie. Um, some of you may know this movie. Um, for those of you that have, you know, don't like Christmas, maybe a few Grinches out there, uh, it's, it's a Wonderful Life is the name of the movie, and the basic premise of the movie is our character here in the middle is George Bailey, and George is down on himself, he's having a hard time, and he says, you know what? Everybody would be better off if I never existed, if I just never was here. And throughout the course of the movie, again, if you haven't seen it, sorry, um, it's only like 70 years old, um, so don't mean to give a few things away. Uh, but if you haven't seen the movie, you know, we go through all his life and all of the impacts he made, all the lives that he touched, and at the end of the day, he realizes the punchline is, you know, he's really had a wonderful life and he's helped a lot of people. This is us. We're all George Bailey. Every one of us influences and touches lives every single day. We have an impact, sometimes for the good, sometimes for the bad, but we've got an impact on those that we interact with, those we come in contact with, those we touch. Sometimes that interaction is small, right? You may walk into a store, somebody open the door for you, you smile, you say thank you. You may notice something about a coworker or a friend and compliment them, and that may be the only thing that made their day. Sometimes we're bitter and hasty, may cut somebody off in traffic, may get a little too loud in a meeting, and maybe we've hurt somebody else's day. But either way, we impact lives all the time. There is a diplomat named Elihu Burritt. He was an American diplomat in the turn of the century. And again, this one, I gotta give credit to Michael because he's the only one that would read American diplomats literature. But he found this quote for us. It, it's, our influences echo in eternity. The sunlight of that world will reveal my finger marks in their primary formations and in all their successive strata of thought and life. This one stops traffic for me, right? I want you to think about the fact that, that in the sunlight of that world, in the sunlight of eternity, all these people that are gathered into the throne are going to have my fingerprints all over them the fingerprints of the interactions I had in my life. And I think about this when I think about Judgment Day. And, and I think about the fact that, that those that are welcomed in, that belong to God, God's going to talk about all the ways in which he pursued them. When you were down and when you were out and you were lost, I sent these people after you to bring you back. And those that are lost, that have no part with God, we're going to be without excuse. I'm convinced the hell of hells is when God tells us on Judgment Day, Mike, I came after you 4,322 times. And I sent Michael into your life, and I sent Mickey into your life, and I sent Ron into your life, and I sent Sam into your life, and I sent all these people in your life to beg you to look at me. And you said, no, depart from me, I know you're not. Because friends, the reality is our fingerprints are all over people we interact with. And what is that influence doing? Is it an influence for good or is it an influence for bad? If we're supposed to be the salt of the world, if our influences echo in eternity, 
What's that salt taste like? If Jesus tells us that, that our job is to be salt and light, that our job here is to influence others as a direct reflection of our master, what's that look like? What's that feel like? What's that taste like? We're going to spend some time this week talking about the different flavor notes, the distinctive properties of salt. And, and while we're going to get into the you know, scientific part of it, those flavor notes are going to be the distinctive profile traits you and I have to have when we belong to Jesus. The distinctive profile traits that others are going to taste in our lives. When we talk about salt, salt's a very interesting way to describe this. I mean, of all the things Jesus said we could be, you know, light, I think we get, everybody gets, it's a dark room, you shine some light, we can see everything in the room, right? That metaphor is easy. But salt? I mean, why salt? I mean, there may be some of you in this room this morning that's taking a little blood pressure medicine because you're a little heavy with the salt shaker, right? Salt is a rock, and salt is plentiful. You can find salt literally everywhere in the world. And the properties of this rock are, you know, it, it preserves. You know, we think about, you know, meat in the, back in the, the old days. You know, some of you may remember that or hear stories about that. Not everybody had a freezer or a refrigerator. Or maybe you got a block of ice once a week. But in the old days, if you killed something, you had to pack that in salt to preserve it. Salt preserves. Salt has medicinal properties. You'll find salt in a lot of medicines that you take. There's a mix of salt. that you, Some people in this audience may be taking a specific salt for some ailment that you have, some different profile of this. Salt was also used as, as shorthand for wealth. I mean, it was so plentiful, it was used so much that, that it talks about as, as shorthand for wealth. Come with me to Ezra chapter 4 and verse 14. In Ezra chapter 4 and verse 14, now this is Ezra. Remember that, that Ezra and Nehemiah were sent back to bring the people out of captivity back to the promised land. <coughs> and Ezra, as he's writing back, giving his report to the king, he says that we live or we are sustained by the king's salt. Interesting way to say that, isn't it? Except that we understand that the king's salt it's the king's wealth. It's, it's the wealth of the king of the Persian Empire that is sustaining their entire endeavors to rebuild Jerusalem. I find that interesting. I find it interesting that, that we use this today a lot. You know, some of you in this crowd may be on salary. You ever thought about where the term salary comes from? Well, the root of salt is sala or Saul. And in the Roman Empire, if you were a Roman soldier, part of your compensation package was an allotment of salt. And they called it a salarium. Well, in our vernacular, that's now what we call a salary, your stipend that you get for doing your job. If you're not punching a clock, you're doing your job. We just pay you so much every single week. So we see this. I mean, shorthand for wealth, it's used plentifully. We can find it everywhere. It's got medicinal purposes. It's got agricultural purposes. Sometimes that you can throw it into the manure pile or, or into the ground to help. But if you oversalt the ground, you destroy it. So there's a balancing act there. So we, we find this concept everywhere, but we also find it not only in positive sides, but we find conversations about salt in our present vernacular negatively too, Right? You ever worked with somebody that isn't worth their salt? Ever thought about where that comes from? It's not worth their pay, right? It's not worth their pay or somebody that is said to betray the salt or betray their master. So I find this just super interesting. <coughs> Forget about all the other things that are theologically wrong with the picture of the Last Supper. That's, we don't have time for that today. Maybe another, another lesson in another series. But here's Judas with the money bag. Notice what Judas knocked over. Big cup of salt. In Da Vinci, when he's picturing the Last Supper, when he's trying to, to visualize all that's going on, I find it just fascinating that he decides to draw and paint this reference to Judas betraying his master's salt. Wrapped up in all of this, we, again, words used 
commonly, phrases are used commonly, but our time, our effort, our attention here for this meeting is, what does it mean to be the salt of the earth? What does it mean to be salty? What does it mean for us to have these distinctive profiles and flavors where we're here to help the world? Well, let's start first with the fact that, that salt seasons. Salt's here to season a bland world. The world is bland. And, and, and all you got to do is look around and see that the, the disposition of the world is about me. Not about anybody else. It's about me. And how can I get more of mine's? That's what the world looks at things. But when our distinctive flavor profile is different from that, it's against the way the world thinks. The world is, is bland and has always has been bland. But salt overcomes blandness. Come with me to Job chapter 6 and verse 6. And this is a passage that's, that's again, fascinating. So Job, in having this conversation in, in all of the context of chapter 6, Job is throwing out rhetorical facts, right? Job is just telling him, you know, basically everybody knows this stuff. And so in Job chapter six, here in verse six, Job talks about the fact that if something is bland, it can't be tasted without salt. And he said, even the white of the egg. So those of you that love being healthy and eat only egg whites, you know, those things are terrible without salt, right? We have scriptural proof that egg whites are terrible if you don't put some salt on them. The Holy Spirit recorded this for us. It's salty, but we know that, right? We know that certain food is it's just bland. You know, you eat it and it's there and it's sustenance, but it's bland. The world, if you'll pardon my metaphor, are egg whites. That they're just bland doing what the world does, but my job, our job is to salt that, to give them a different flavor profile, that when they taste me, when they taste you, that, that it tastes better than everything else that they've tasted before. It tastes different. It's distinctive. Christ had this trait in mind, didn't he? When he said, if salt has lost its taste, that if we're bland just like the rest of the world, if we're supposed to be the salt of the earth, but we taste like egg whites, he's saying, what good are you? Well, you've lost this. What are we doing if we taste just like the rest of the world? If we don't taste different, then we cannot and will not affect change. But how are we seasoning the world? That's the big question. What am I doing in my life to season the rest of the world? Come with me to Colossians chapter 4. And in Colossians chapter 4, you know, Paul writing here to the, the, the church at Colossae about some, some things that are going on there. Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6. He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. And let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So again, I want us to think about that. In our interactions with outsiders, those outside the church, those that are in the world, how should our interactions be? They should be seasoned with salt. They should be gracious. Now, why is that? Because grace tastes different. Because everybody else in the world that they interact with that interacts without grace tastes the same. So therefore, it's bland. But if we're seasoned with salt, seasoned with grace, it feels different. I'll give you an example of that. In Acts chapter 17, when we get to the Philippian jailer, everybody remembers the story of the Philippian jailer. <clears throat> it's one we've talked about. I'm sure you guys have talked about in Bible class for years and years. But think about what happens that night. Paul and Silas are locked in the middle part of the prison. Now, who else do we put in the middle part of the prison? The worst criminals, right? They're shackled and they're chained and they're in the dead center of that prison, right? And as they're in the dead center of that prison, what are they doing all night long? They're singing and praying. Now, again, you all learned this week, my mind goes in weird places sometimes. But have you ever thought about what are they singing? Or how are they praying? You think Paul and Silas are in the middle of the prison singing, oh, woe is me. No, it's probably on key too. But 
they were probably singing something like a song we sing, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms. And if you know the words of that song, it's, What have I to dread? What have I to fear? I'm leaning on the everlasting arms. Now, I know they didn't sing it because that wasn't written until about 1,700 years later, but they were singing songs like that, saying, I'm not afraid, I'm with Jesus, everything's going to be okay. And I, I guarantee their prayers were not only for themselves, but for anybody that could hear their voice. So all night long, they're singing and praying this way. So what's happening? All of the prisoners are tasting that. Because why? Everybody else in prison, the other bland ones, are singing, woe is me. How am I going to get out of this? And about midnight, right, all the shackles come off. All the doors are opened. Now, why do you lock up prisoners? Anybody think about that? Why you lock up prisoners? Because if you don't, they leave, right? If we don't have the doors locked, if they're not in chains, these guys are going to walk back out. So the jailer, when he comes... He sees the doors open. He's like, my prisoners are gone. And if my prisoners are gone, my boss is not going to want to talk about this. He's going to want to take my head off. So he draws his sword. He is at hopelessness, peak hopelessness. He's ready to take his own life. But what happens? Paul and Silas say, stop, turn on the lights or turn up the torches. We're all here. And he looks at them. And he sees them, but what he's done is him and all the other prisoners, because remember, they didn't leave either, right? Not only are just Paul and Silas there, everybody's there, right? But they've tasted Paul and Silas all night long. And they froze where they were. And the jailer looks at Paul and Silas, and what does he say? We use the word, and it's written in the scripture, what must I do? Here's what he says, friends. I want what you got. Because I am without hope, and you are full of hope. I've tasted you all night long while you were singing and praying. These prisoners have tasted you all night long while you're singing and praying. Now, was Paul and Silas, do you believe their intent was to baptize the entire prison? I don't think so. I'm convinced Paul and Silas were just doing what they do. That if I'm in a difficult situation, I sing and I pray. And I put all these things in God's hands. And I'm convinced Paul and Silas thought the same thing that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego thought. My God is able to save me, but even if he doesn't, I'm still okay. That tastes wildly different than the rest of the world, doesn't it? Because how many people in Babylon watched Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, I'll bow down to this thing. I don't care if I believe it or not. I'm just trying to save my own skin. But the fact that they made that statement, the fact that Paul and Silas, as they sing and prayed, showed, demonstrated, and magnified their faith so that all the others that were in earshot could hear and taste. That's why we're seasoning the world. That's why we've got to be careful how we interact with outsiders. Because if we interact with outsiders to the same way they interact with the problems of the world, guess what? We're just like them. And if you're just like me, I don't really care what your spiritual philosophy is because you're just as bad off as I am. But if you're different, if you taste different, if you react different, if you have things that I don't have that's now attractive because I've seen it, because I've tasted it, now we can have a conversation. How many of you think that the Philippian jailer wanted to take them back to his house so that they could debate the merits of baptism? No, the jailer, I promise you, Paul and Silas could have told that jailer he needed to stand on his head for the next six months, and that's how he'd be saved. He'd have been like, all right, boys, prop me up at the corner. It wasn't a debate about what should be done. It's, I want to do whatever I have to do because I want what you have. When we season the world, when they see and when they taste us, that's what they taste. They taste Jesus in our lives, and they say, I've got to have that. The delicious flavor of grace that we see. Come over with me to Ephesians chapter 4. <clears throat> In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. <clears throat> Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, 
but only such that is good for building up as it fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. Now, how many of you have read that passage and heard it, probably especially in a high school Bible class or a college Bible class, and you read that verse and said, all right, kids, don't cuss. I mean, that's what we think. Like, all right, no corruptive speech, so I'm just not supposed to cuss. No, no, no. Read the text again. What does he say? He said, let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but then he defines it. He says, only such that is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those that hear. So what he's saying is, what's just as bad as four-letter words is me being Debbie Downer. If I walk around in my life like I was weaned on a pickle, nobody wants to be like me. If I'm not extending grace and encouraging others, nobody wants to do anything that I'm doing. So if our speech, if our interactions with others are not built doing so to build up, but instead are tearing down or negative or, I'm going to go back and steal that word again, bland, what are we doing? We're turning people off to Jesus. Oh, you belong to Jesus? That's the way you act? Mm, I don't know, thanks. Our speech, that distinctive flavor note. Come back with me to Luke chapter 4. Because <coughs> Jesus says something very similar. Or actually, Jesus has a similar interaction, should I say. In Luke chapter 4, in verse 22, Jesus is putting this thing in place. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. And they said, is this not Joseph's son? So again, pardon my vernacular here. They tasted Jesus' words. And they marveled at them. Had these people never heard a rabbi speak before? Absolutely, they'd heard rabbis speak all the time. They'd heard the Pharisees tell them exactly what they're doing wrong and all this stuff. But Jesus comes... And he stands up and he gives encouraging, gracious words. And they're like, wait a minute, isn't that Joseph's boy? How does he know this? Friends, you ever thought that you can't overcome your background? I'll tell you, I've got no problem being transparent in the pulpit. I was a punk and a jerk from about 16 to circa 20-something. All right? Maybe a little longer, Michael says. (laughs) Give me a standard deviation there, all right? And I remember as I went back, I held the first meeting back in the congregation that I grew up in. And I'm back there that week. And again, fairly funny story. So one of the deacons at the time comes up to me, he says, Mike, he's like, I'm so glad you're preaching, so glad you're doing some stuff. He said, do you remember what my first recollection of you is? No, no idea. He said, there was another kid that goes to church here that you were beating up on the way home from school. And I had to send my son to walk him home so he wouldn't get beat up. And you beat both of them up. I'm glad you're here for the meeting. (laughs) And we're going to talk about grace for the meeting. We can overcome whatever our past is by gracious words. Some of us believe that the scars we have from the people we used to be before we were Jesus disqualifies us for service. But I'm going to tell you, it doesn't disqualify you. It actually further qualifies you, right? So, you know, there may be some of you in here that are, that are into weight loss and getting fit and all that, right? I don't care about guys like Michael that have been 115 pounds their whole life, right? I don't care what he does. I don't care about his diet. Give me the guy that was four and a hook and now is 155. I want to know what he did because he's been there and now he's found the way back. Those of us that have been rough, that have hit rock bottom and found their way to Jesus, those guys need the pulpit. Those guys need to be teaching class because their gracious words of what it's like to be at rock bottom and to get back, that tastes different. But what doesn't taste different is when we're just like everybody else. Well, you know, I was raised rough, so I'm just going to be rough. No. I had some bad shakes in life. Mama didn't hug me enough when I was a kid, so I'm just going to be a jerk. No, that's not okay. We can all change regardless of our background. That's what that salt looks like. That's what that flavor profile is, is if God can take a roughneck like me and turn him into a halfway decent human being, what could he do with other people? 
What can God do if I'm just trying a little bit? They marveled at his words. So what does it look like for us? Come over with me to 2 Timothy chapter 2. <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 24. It says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone. And if you're in the, in the notice of highlighting things in your Bible, highlight everyone. Not just people we like, not just nice people, everyone. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil, correcting opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading them to a knowledge of truth. And, may, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. So here's what I want you to think about. I want you to think about the fact that if we are quarrelsome, if we're picking a fight, if we're out there to, if we come first with the rod, remember what, what Paul said to the church at Corinth? How shall I come to you? Shall I come to you with a rod or shall I come to you with tears? Like if, we, if all we got's a rod and we don't have the tears in our bag, we're messing up. If we're quarrelsome in our approach, if we're quarrelsome to tell somebody you're going to burn in hell as opposed to patiently enduring with them, able to teach. Now, I don't know how many of you, this is one of those passages that I struggle with. I struggle because I don't know how many of us want to raise our hands if I say, all right, this afternoon we're going to meet at the building and all of us are going to patiently endure evil. I don't think I'm getting a lot of people to come to that class, right? None of us want to sign up for that, but notice that that's baked in. That if we're going to help save the world, we're going to have to patiently endure some evil. And if we react to evil the way the rest of the world does, and we start saying things like, well, this isn't fair, and I shouldn't have to do this, and we get confrontational with it instead of patiently enduring with it, do you know what we taste like? The rest of the world. We taste like an egg white. We're back to this bland idea. But in practice... When we're confronted with the same situation that the rest of the world is, we've got to react differently than they do. That's what salt does. It reacts differently than they do. And he says that from that, God may perhaps grant them repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth. How many times have you all heard this phrase? Nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care, right? So if my first interaction with you is to tell you all the ways you're wrong and all the things you've done bad and how you're going to burn in hell, how much does that person care what I have to say? Whether I'm right or not. Folks, I think sometimes we're more worried about being right than we are about saving a soul. And I'm the first one that's guilty of that. Look, young Mike, young, full of you know, energy and zeal Mike, was the first one to sit somebody down and undress them. I, I'm, in a lot of ways, as close as Michael and I are as friends, we are polar opposites. You know, when, when It's a Wonderful Life comes on, he cries, I laugh. I'm looking for elf and, and funny things, right? But also, if there's time for a confrontation, he wants no part of it, and I'm all in. But that doesn't do very good when you're trying to help somebody save a soul, right? If what I want to do is confront you, I want to dress you down. I want to fuss at you about where you are and tell you you're going to burn in hell if you don't change this. That goes against everything Paul's telling Timothy. And what's Timothy's job? Young preacher, right? Timothy, if you're going to save the world, if you're going to help people see their souls, you got to be far more worried about saving the soul than you are about being right. I'm not saying truth doesn't come into play here. Please don't misunderstand anything I'm saying this morning. I'm not saying we water down the truth, we hide from the truth, we bend the truth. Don't misunderstand me. But we can season it. There's a softer way to say things. I'm the first one to tell you I've said the right thing the wrong way a lot. And I've won a ton of arguments and lost a lot of souls. And that's what keeps me up at night. Is if I was just a little softer, how would that conversation have gone? 
Our words have to be seasoned with salt. We have to be ones that are trying to snatch them from the fire. But the problem we run into, friends, is, is one of two different things. Either one, we spiritually profile them. And we say, they're pretty rough. I don't think they're going to listen to the gospel. They're not a good candidate, right? We, we just go through the list and we're like, ah what they've been through, where they've been, their family, where they grew up, where they live in that part of town. I mean, those people just, we got to get them, nah. Let's go find some people in the nicer subdivision that maybe just cheat on their taxes a little bit. We got to understand that every soul is important to God. Every single one. God does not delight in the death of the wicked. I think sometimes we get this terrible view of the judgment day where we think it's God up there with the lightning bolt and he's casting people in the lake of the fire, which is the second death, and he's got this big evil grin on his face like, ha, ah, I told you. Friends, if that's the way you view Judgment Day, you have completely misunderstood the entire Bible. The Judgment Day scene is going to be a heavenly father with tears in his eyes saying, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I would have gathered you in. That's how God views sinners. That's how God views me when I'm down and out, is that he wants to bring me in. He doesn't want to cast me out. So our view that tastes different is, friend, I don't care where you've been. I don't care what you've done. I'm worried about where we're going together. I'm worried about how we're going to get you from where you are right now to Jesus, because that's all that matters. Doesn't matter. I don't care. You've been in jail? Fine. You've been a junkie? Fine. You've been disobedient to parents. You've been a murderer. You know what? There's grace for you too. Because I can line up a bunch of murderers that did a lot of murdering in the Bible that turned out to be fantastic Christians. That turned out to be fantastic leaders. That took very bad places that they had been and turned them into something greater. But the million dollar question here, friends, are we dispensing grace or ungrace. So grace is unmerited favor, right? Things that we don't deserve. We're going to talk about deserve a lot this week. If you think that four-letter words are the worst words you can use in your vocabulary, they're not. Deserve is. If you think we deserve anything, deserve means I'm owed this, you're out of your ever-loving mind. We're not deserved anything. The wages of sin are death. That's what we deserve. We deserve justice. We beg for grace, but we deserve justice. When we dispense ungrace, we're telling people, you need justice. But there's not one of us that understands the difference between justice and grace that wants to raise their hand and said, Lord, give me justice. Every last one of us are on our knees saying, Lord, please just give me grace. The problem we have in our lives and the problem that the world has is that what they want to do is they want justice because they're going to get away with it, right? If I commit all these sins and then God just forgives me, then I've gotten away with it. And we say that like it's a bad thing. <laughs> Hallelujah that we've gotten away with it. Hallelujah that the wages of my sin are death and God has given me the free gift of eternal life. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because that's what all of us want. But we've got to understand that in order to get there, in order to have people come out of those circumstances where all they expect is justice because all the world gives is justice, is that we've got to have the delicious flavor of grace in our lives. We've got to treat them with grace so that they know what grace is like. I'll never forget this. I had a Bible study with a young lady and I'm talking to her, this is, again, sometimes I'm stupid and I don't ask enough questions, but I begin talking to her about the love of God and what a loving heavenly father looks like and all the ways in which God loves her. And she looks at me and she says, Mike, I don't know what that means. So what do you mean you don't know what that means? I had an abusive father. I had a bad home life. What do you mean a father loves you in spite of what you've done? And it caught me. She couldn't understand the concept of what it meant to be loved. 
And there's a lot of people in this world that don't know what that looks like. So how do they find that? You and me. Because if we are a salt source for God, if, if our job is to salt the world to be that flavor profile, sometimes the only love and grace they're ever going to see is from you and me. We've got spiritual orphans scattered all over this county and all over this country. But we've got to be the family that they've never seen. We've got to show them things that they've never understood because it doesn't make sense to them. What makes sense is what makes sense to the world. It's all about reciprocity. They are loved on a conditional basis. If you do this for me, then I love you. But if you don't do that, I don't love you anymore. Grace and the delicious flavor of grace comes when we understand the distinctive flavor of Jesus. Come with me to Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 29. And I know somebody rang that bell in the back, and I'm probably going to run out of time. So we read this earlier. We're talking about this delicious flavor of grace, of, of what it looks like. I'm sorry, I got away from myself. We're in 1 Peter 2, 2 and 3. Here's what it looks like in practice. Like newborn infants long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. If indeed, listen, you have tasted that the Lord is good. How we taste if the Lord's good? How does anybody taste that? I mean, are you going to go up and you know, lick God's hand? How are you going to taste that? It's you and me, right? They're tasting God every time they taste us, every interaction we have. They're tasting God. But here's the million-dollar question, friends. What does that taste like? Does it, does it taste bitter or does it taste good? Does it taste like something we want? Does it draw them back to Jesus or does it push them away? Because Peter says if we do it right, that it will cause them to long for Jesus. Isn't that what happens in John chapter 7, verse 37? In John chapter 7, we see, you know, Jesus in, in his interaction here. He talks about giving them living water. Why do they need living water? Because they're thirsty. Why are they thirsty? Because they've tasted Jesus, right? If in our interactions with life, people taste Jesus on us, they get thirsty for Jesus. Where do we do? We take them to get living water. Jesus gives them living water, cleanses them, and turns them into another salt source. It's a cycle here, right? That if we're salting them, and if y'all have ever had anything that's salty, you open up a big bag of chips, and about halfway down, what are you doing? You're looking for something to drink, right? But spiritually salting, they're not thirsty for a glass of water. They're thirsty for Jesus. And the impact here of these grace-filled lives, we can go on and on through all of these, but again, we're out of time. So I encourage you, write these down, look them up. We'll get you the slides afterwards. But the end result is where we're at in 1 Peter chapter 3. So come over a page. 1 Peter chapter 3, 1 and 2. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. Now look, I, I'm the first one to tell you, young Mike thought that was stupid. I disagree with Peter. I thought, Peter, you're out of your mind. Nobody is going to do this. And then it happened in my life. My dad, before I was born, shipwrecked his faith, left the church, left religion, didn't have anything to do with it. My mom drug roughnecked teenage kids to church. She took us and she sat in Bible study. And mom's not one to nag, not one to press. That's not who mom is. Mom's very submissive. But yet I watched over my lifetime mom drip on him. Dad, taste her life, taste her submission, taste what she was doing. And before dad died, a few years before he died, dad repented, turned, changed his life. Why? Because this works. And sometimes when we read scripture and we think about things and we think there's no way this works, we're the ones that are wrong, friends. God got this right. 
very quickly, this is what we were just talking about. And you're going to see this diagram all week long. Grace that we bestow on others' lives cause thirst. That thirst leads them to Jesus. Jesus quenches that thirst by grace, by mercy, by forgiveness, by washing clean. That grace makes us a salt source. Because we appreciate what Jesus has done for us, we give it to others and we show grace to others. And round and around you go, and friends, that's what personal evangelism looks like. Personal evangelism isn't just about Bible studies. Personal evangelism is about people tasting Jesus in our lives and us drawing them back to him. Thank you for your time and your attention this morning.